Okay. Okay, so uh, my name is Karen Eden, and I have Dr. Heidi Nelson joining me. The two of us are going to present Mammal Screen today. And so we're going to hand the mic off a few times, so that, that, that's planned. Um, so what we're going to be presenting is a, a tool that helps patients and clinicians know which patients are above average risk for breast cancer and also provides a decision aid so they can decide how often to be screened and when to start screening, all those kinds of details. All right, I realize I have to push this, okay. All right, and the summer interns for this are Ayo and Gokul. Raise your hands. So these are the two summer interns, and I'll talk a little bit about their projects here in just a few minutes. Okay, so the current screening recommendations for average risk women are to initiate mammography no earlier than age 40 and no later than age 50. And one of the key points in there is for average risk, okay? But how do you know if you're average risk? This tool helps you know that. Um, and it occurs at least biannually, as frequently as annually, continues until age 74, and, but age alone should not be the basis for stopping screening. And decisions regarding when to initiate screening and how often to screen and when to stop screening should be based on periodic shared decision making, which we're going to learn about a little bit today, involving the woman and her health care provider. All right, so first of all, you might be wondering, what is shared decision making? Shared decision making is an approach so that women, the woman and her provider, her clinician, her physician, can have conversation to understand the risks and benefits of screening and they can assess what's really important to the women in making this decision. And, but it should consider things like the patient's own breast cancer risk, what her life expectancy is, what comorbidities. And I threw this, this Venn diagram up here because, um, you know, we have medical evidence, we have patient preferences, we have clinical circumstances, and all of this has to be brought into that whole conversation. So you can't just read a paper and decide, okay, that paper says I shouldn't be screened, done. It's, it's a much more complex decision than that. All right, so this tool that we have created, Heidi and I, um, is a risk tool to identify above average risk and average risk patients based on major risk factors in family history. And she's going to speak a little bit about those risk factors and why those are really important to identify. Um, women who are average risk go on to use this tool called a decision aid to help them decide when to begin screening and how often to go. Um, there's educational material, there's a priority setting activity, and then there's a customized report that the woman and um, her clinician can use to, in a shared way, decide what's the best strategy for her. All right, so this um, tool is called Mammal Screen, and you can actually go in and try it. Um, we actually just finished um, implementing this with three OHSU clinical practices in general internal medicine. And the women in that clinic who were age appropriate and didn't have a history of breast or ovarian cancer were, given a, were sent a MyChart message encouraging them to use this new tool that we had created. And then we collected data on feasibility, uptake, and, cl and, and clinical outcomes. All right, so now let's begin to talk about those risk factors that are very important to, um, to, make, to indicate whether a person's average or above average. Hi. Um, first off, let me just see, do we have anybody in the room who's a clinician at this point? We have quite a few people. Well, you probably know that there are actually very few things in medicine that are clear cut. We all try to boil it down and make it uh, really clear cut, but there are very few things that it's actually really clear what you're supposed to do or advise to patients. Patients don't always fit. Uh, the studies that we've, uh, we've read, the things we've been taught, um, every case is a little uniquely different. Some are a lot different. And in the field of prevention and screening, this is especially important because actually harms are more important to consider than benefits because you don't want to take a healthy person off the street and in the name of prevention, you don't want to hurt them do something that actually is not good for them. And so that's why weighing benefits and harms is so important in prevention particularly. If you had um, end-stage cancer or, or a serious illness, you might take a few more risks for, for a treatment because the alternative doesn't look so great. In prevention, the alternative is, well, I just go back to my life and don't get screened. 
and there could be a bad outcome there, but it's, it's, it's not in your face kind of like uh, with treatment. So it's very different. So that's why we emphasize um, benefits and harms. And that's why, a big reason why shared decision making is even probably more important in these fuzzy areas. And in the longer version of this talk, we spend quite a bit of time going through those fuzzy areas and why they're fuzzy. Um, but the fact that we aren't, aren't real uh, clear or accurate about how to identify a high-risk person is because all the risk calculators that have been invented don't really work. They were developed from population data, and they uh, don't work on individual individual women. They don't. Um, they're poor predictors of an individual risk. So any kind of calculator, the famous Gill model, is almost as just barely better than a coin toss when you're talking to an individual patient. So uh, as you saw from the breast cancer screening um, guidelines that were shown. They're, the edges are really fuzzy. I spent years going through all that data, and we really don't see, none of the trials show benefit for women in their 40s to screen. They just don't have mortality benefit. But there are women in that group who should be screened because they're not your population average person. So uh, what we wanted to do with MammaScreen is to help clinicians and patients at least triage or sort them out in um, a way that doesn't falsely imply accuracy, like a Gale model that gives you a very precise estimate that really doesn't even make sense. Uh, what we try to do to determine risk is to get what we call the flags, kind of high risk flags. Anybody who has any of these things that we start off mammoth screen with is um, raising a flag for a clinical action. It's much more practical and we thought more useful to clinicians and patients. So the high risk flags are anybody who has a symptom. So uh, we, we actually didn't even have this in the early versions because we thought, well, for screening, people you know, don't have symptoms. But we found out that a lot of um, people, uh, women, as we were screening them or asking them about getting into the study, they actually had lumps or, or something, they were something they were concerned about. So the very first question is, are you having any symptoms now? Uh, breast skin changes, lumps, bumps, kind of a, a list of things. And in reality, most of those turn out to be benign. But you really don't go into a, a decision uh, process unless you can kind of evaluate current symptoms. So that's kind of the first question. You're having symptoms, if you do, uh, they're directed to uh, to go see their clinician and work that up. Is it a big deal or not? Sometimes it is. Most of the time it's not. But it's good to get that out of the way first. Then there are, it's a short list of very important risk factors that put you in a high risk surveillance group. There's no need for you to go deeper into this tool than that. So right off we ask them these stories. Uh, one of them is having had uh, high-level radiation from age 10 to 30. Someone who was treated with Hodgkin lymphoma, for instance, not just somebody getting a lot of chest x-rays. Uh, that's very unusual, but there are people out there, especially in an uh, academic medical center, who may have had high-level radiation exposure during those ages, and they should just go on to a special pathway of their own. Uh, we also know there are uh, uh, pathogenic mutations of certain genes that increase your risk for breast cancer quite high uh, levels. Uh, sometimes uh, people have family members with those and they don't really know what their status is. Sometimes they know their status. And they're followed very differently. Those are the BRCA1 and 2 genes. So anyone with a pathogenic mutation or a family with pathogenic mutations needs to go to the genetic counseling clinic and work that up rather than go to the mammoth screen tool. And of course, there are a lot of survivors of breast cancer, fewer survivors of ovarian cancer, but a lot of survivors of breast cancer or even early, very early stages especially, uh, go on for many, many years in primary care clinics, and they're actually managed a little differently uh, in follow-up screening. So uh, they're, they're just kind of flying under the radar in primary care, so we need to identify who they are and figure out what would their, be their surveillance pattern. So these are kind of the big flags at the beginning. Why go to some calculator that doesn't really give you a meaningful number when there's actually some big stuff at the front end. So if they get yes to any of those, they have a clinically actionable um, red flag, and then we um, have them leave the tool and go on to follow up. So the next part, oh, we also work through uh, another area that may or may not be an important risk factor is if they've had a previous breast biopsy. Now, sadly, a lot of people got biopsies and don't really know what the answer to the biopsy was, except maybe it wasn't cancer. But there are many intermediate high-risk lesions um, that just sort of fall off of people's memories because they have you know, fancy names and um, maybe it wasn't really explained that they're, they're a high-risk lesion or not. Most of those biopsies are benign, um, but people often don't know. 
Uh, so if they've had any, any biopsies that were uh, high resolutions or certainly cancer, they get a message and follow up with their clinic. If they aren't sure, they also, there's some follow up as to let's figure out what that is, if it's important or not. In a separate study, we actually looked at how well pathologists agree on these biopsies. And sadly, for those high resolutions, there's only a 50% concordance. So uh, that's a, a wishy-washy area as well. So that, that needs a little more rigor. And patients need to know the uncertainty of that particular diagnosis. So those people get moved through the system uh, and may or may not go into mammoth screen. Then we go uh, looking at their family history of genetic uh, risk for cancer. And this adapts a CDC developed tool. It's a triage tool. It's not telling you that you need to go get your, your genes tested uh, at this point, but it will triage you to um, uh, a sus suspicious risk group that will go to maybe a genetic counselor where they spend at least an hour with you and pull up all kinds of wonderful uh, kindred software and spend a lot of time with you actually sorting this out. So this is a triage tool to get people to genetic counseling if they need to or not. So the next, where do we are? Oh, so here um, we also, uh, this is how it fits in. Those questions are part of this. Uh, part of this is being uh, Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry increases your risk for some of those uh, pathogenic mutations. It's not I mean, on a majority of people, it's a small proportion of Ashkenazi Jewish individuals, but it's there. We need to know that. Uh, family history, uh, if they go through the questions, they get through all of this, then they go to the decision aid. Okay, so now um, the people who move on to use the decision aid, they are, are women who are average risk. And we developed this decision aid um, through meeting with um, ph physicians and clinicians and with patients, because what we wanted to write this in a way that it was it was very understandable. So this first screen, that this first picture that you look at actually went through quite a bit of uh, change. And in fact, Lindsay, who helped us with this early on, who's, in the, who's joined us today, can speak to all the different ways that this, this, this graphic changed. The initial graphic was one individual woman, and we actually had a very aggressive cancer on one side of her body and a less aggressive on the other side. Everybody quickly understood the tortoise and the hare. They understood the side of the lesions, but what we didn't recognize until we were interviewing patients is that they misunderstood that they thought, oh, one side of my, if, I, if the cancer's on the left side of the body, it's gonna be more aggressive, and that was not what we meant. So we went back to our graphic artists and we said, we need to change this. Um, because it was, it was conveying a message we hadn't intended. So we do a lot of work to make sure that things are written in a way that's understandable and that convey a message that we intended. Okay, this figure two went through a lot of changes. You probably have seen pictographs where they might show a thousand dots. Some of them are colored in certain ways. Well, people have a hard time with a denominator of a thousand. That's, that's very hard to understand. So this, this particular flow um, chart tested very well. And um, we had to actually do a, quite a bit of work just even in the plain language here. Uh, initially, when we had this, this design, we did not have the words is missed. So you see we have 1,000 women, average risk, have a, have a mammogram in their 40s today. 125 are going to get that dreaded phone call, we see something, we'd like to have some more imaging. 875 are gonna to be told that they have normal results. However, one cancer is missed. Originally we just said one cancer. And when we interviewed patients about those two forms, they, the woman said, well, I'm really worried about this because it's missed but it was actually missed in the other diagram as well. We just didn't have the words, is missed. So that's, what, that's the kind of testing you have to do with products so that patients really understand what you mean. But now let's follow this path. For the 125 who get that phone call, saying we need to do more testing, 121 do not have cancer, two cancers would be found, and two precancers would be found. All right, so now, as you may recall, when I first introduced this new study that we were doing, we wanted to look at uptake. We wanted to know how many patients and would actually use the tool if they're invited to use it. So what we found is if you send a MyChart message inviting a patient from their clinician, the clinician's name was actually in the message, um, so about 76% will open the message. And we sent three messages, the first message and then two reminders. So they had... They had a few opportunities to open this message, but they still had to click on the link to get to mammal screen. So we had 339 out of the 448 we invited who actually opened the invitation. 214 clicked on the link, but did not go forward. 
And um, we have some ideas about why they might not have gone forward. At the time, we had to upload a very long consent form before they could get to the decision aid, and I think that proved to be a barrier. Fortunately, the IRB has recognized that and has a new way to approach that consent process, so we won't have to upload a, a, a very long consent form before they get to the decision aid. But 125 of those 339 consented and went on, and, for, and of those, almost everybody completed. So once they got into the tool, they liked it, and it didn't take a huge amount of time. You're going to see in the next slide. Um, oh, that's just characteristics about who, who responded. Um, but you can see that the time to take to complete the risk algorithm, we're talking about three or four minutes. We're not talking about a 30-minute experience. So it took them three or four minutes. If they were average risk, they went on to use the decision aid. Again, that was like a three-minute experience. That was not a lengthy experience. So this is a tool that could be done as you're sitting and waiting in the waiting for your appointment. So it's not it's not a big time invasive um, experience. Now, what we found, we also interviewed eight patients who participated. They reported that it was highly intuitive. It was easy to navigate through. We did lots of testing on navigation, so we were glad to hear that. Um, and, but it didn't necessarily change their screening attention. Um, and it, what we did learn is that a number of these women were already screening. But where this tool, I think, will be particularly interesting is when we reach that audience that's deciding about screening. Seven of the eight patients would recommend mammal screen to other women who might be less knowledgeable on, um, on, on the benefits and harms of screening and need to decide about getting a mammogram. So at the same time, for those 118 people who completed, we went in and looked at their medical charts. We wanted to see if the medical charts also identified whether someone was above average risk and where that information was in the chart. So we had two medical students who helped us with that. And what we found is that a large amount of the risk information was unstructured, meaning it was listed maybe in family history, but maybe not in the cell. It might have been listed in a progress note. Oh, patient mentioned that grandma so-and-so was diagnosed with breast cancer, but it wasn't formally put into any kind of algorithm like mammal screens. So that information might be there, might not be there. Okay, so what we found is between the two approaches, one approach was using mammal screen, the other approach was, was mining the chart. 21 women were identified as above average risk out of that 118, but there was not agreement. Only in the case of seven did both mammal screen and the chart, using the same algorithm both ways, identified women who were above average risk. So in order to get complete information on the patient, you really need to have both. And that's where we're going to move into what the summer interns are helping with this summer. We did interviews also with our three physicians and one MA. They had a positive experience. They felt the patients were empowered and more informed. Um, they would like to link it with a, with a planned visit, which you know, I think would be very possible. Um, they also wanted to have more flexibility on notifications. So for example, one of our clinicians who was also a co-investigator on the project, she wanted to get to know what every one of her patients used the tool, whether they're average risk or not. But the others really wanted a priority. They wanted to be notified if someone had symptoms clearly, but also the average risk, the above average risk women who weren't being screened. And so they didn't want their boxes filling up with all these reports. So, so that made sense to us. Okay, so now we get on to what Io and Gokul are doing. This tool is right now in English, but we know that when we roll it out, for example, to Tuality and some of the other locations, having the tool in Spanish will be really important. So I was helping us with that. He's already sent a translation version to our programmer who will be uploading it to the website so that we'll be able to test a Spanish version. Um, and then Gokul is helping us with integrating Mammal Screen better with Epic. So let me put up this like ugly, scary looking diagram. It's not that bad. Um, and so, so at the beginning, we have Epic. And in there, there's information about the patient and there's history. Um, and so from Epic, using my chart, are you all familiar with my chart? I see lots of people nodding, yay. Um, there's the message is sent to the patient, inviting them to use mammal screen. They use mammal screen, there's a report that's generated, they go through the the risk algorithm, but we somehow have to get that information back over here to EPIC. And right now, it's very manual, meaning the research coordinator and the MA had to upload the report 
and do a lot of the, the routing and triaging and messaging but ideally, this would be done more invisibly. So Gokola is helping us with beginning that using a tool called Smart on Fire. So that platform is where he's beginning to learn about that platform. So are we, and how we may be able to move forward with that. OK, so just want to acknowledge our funding from the Night Cancer Support Grant and from NLM for supporting the interns on this project. And questions for Heidi and I. Uh, were you able to compare that to patients that normally would just get an invitation from their provider to get a mammogram to see if it increased the number of mammograms that the patients? Not yet. That is something we want to look at in the future. I think we want to look at to see are the more above average patients getting in there, getting screened. Right. We're wanting to take the, the pilot data that we, we got and uh, create a bigger uh, project with clinical outcomes because that's really where it matters. What are patients doing and does it matter? Uh, in their health care. So that would be the next big step, and hopefully we'll get funding for that. That's a good question. Hopefully we can use the Spanish version and have, you know, more diverse population. This is obviously tons of work you guys have already done. It's really amazing to see this. Thank you. Um, how do you envision this tool fitting into um, the clinic workflow, you mentioned that it, uh, that you noticed it doesn't take very much time to, to complete, but you know there, it might be competing with other forms or in the future other apps or what have you. And then also, as you know, the uh, portal and my chart uptake can be uh, a barrier. And then, and, and but but you've also gotten feedback from providers in in terms of how it might integrate into the workflow. So what, how do you think this is going to? And is it going to be all of the above, just as long as it gets done, you know, that you do it at any time? But what are you, what are you seeing going forward? Um, you're asking a really good question, and that's where um, we will, in future work, we're going to be needing to have conversation with patients and with, with the physicians participating, because what we did learn is not, a very, not all of our physicians, they had very different needs in terms of when they wanted to be notified. They didn't want their, some of them didn't want their boxes filled you know, with average risk patients that maybe don't need anything right away. But they did want to know about the patients who had symptoms or above average risk and were not screening. So I think there'll be definitely a qualitative piece to what you're asking. Um, I think we learned a bit from the pilot, but I don't know that we've got an absolute model for everybody. Yeah, I mean, and ideally, what we're doing is sorting through a lot of Merck to get actionable things, which should save everybody time. Currently, it's, it's sort of glacially happening, if at all, and a lot, we found a lot of the women with symptoms or there are a lot of um, people with pretty significant family histories who may need to go through genetic counseling who are, who are never addressed. Uh, so being able to be selective, more personalized, the whole personalized medicine, you know, how do we do that uh, to be able to do it this way may be a, a, a protocol, a, a, a sort of a um, prototype for others as well, uh, so we don't see it as just a breast cancer issue. And maybe, sorry, I'm not doing this very well. Maybe we can uh, iron out the kinks uh, so that if there's a workflow issue, we can improve that. That would be the clinical study. So we're not trying to sell anybody anything to to uh, that they don't need, but maybe it'll make life easier. Uh, so, so I have two questions, and the first one's related to what Ben said, and I also really like the way that you guys kept track of how many um, people were, how many women were engaged in that process and where exactly you lost them at, and then kind of refined along that process of like realizing, oh yeah, we're losing people with this very long informed consent document, we need to revise that. I think that's great. Um, so similarly, do you have any data on how many people you were able to engage who wouldn't otherwise get screen or wouldn't otherwise have access to a shared decision-making tool or wouldn't be discussing it with their doctor? Um, so we, we do have a little bit of information, um, and that's just come in recently. Um, 
we, we found that, and I thought it was going to be higher, that, that of the 118 that we had, only about 60% were regularly getting mammograms, and that's particularly important for the 50 to 74-year-olds where it's recommended. It's, 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 it's more, it's less of an issue for the 40 to 49 year olds, but the, um, I was expecting the, the screening rate was going to be more like 70%, but I don't know, maybe you can speak. Yeah, it was, it was like way below the HEDIS measure, which surprised me. Um, we know that the people uh, engaging um, are self-selecting, uh, and so we need to learn more about, uh, it, are the people who, who didn't pursue this, did they, are they up to date? They just don't really, they know they're up to date, they don't need to go through shared decision making, they just had their mammogram a year ago, whatever, uh, and they didn't bother to open things. We don't really know why they didn't engage. Um, there may be people who aren't technical, so this works well in a, a waiting room situation if they come to their appointment and can actually do it there, whereas other people may be comfortable at home. Uh, so there's a lot we don't know yet, but we need to tailor it to all the users, not just the ones that happen to show up. Right. I mean, didn't we have a higher than expected rate of above average they seem to be more risky, but then by the time we do all the subgroup uh, analyses, we're getting small cells, so we don't want to make too big of conclusions there, but it's helpful in the pilot to know what to anticipate in a bigger study. And the other thing I will say is that we had eight women report symptoms. Of those eight, the clinic was aware of seven, but not the eight. So we actually did identify one person who was currently experiencing symptoms, and that's not a very big pool. Well, we only had 118 women. Um, so we did identify one woman who um, needed to have some fairly quick follow-up. The second question I have is about, um, I know from working on the prostate cancer screening that they're doing some really exciting work like in the UK on kind of refining the algorithm and including a lot more factors in order to um, have better specificity and precision with, you know, with who they decide to screen for prostate cancer. Um, and I realize this doesn't directly relate, relate to the topic of your study, but as you were researching background, did you find out anything interesting about kind of the factors that we should be looking for, including the more complex ones that maybe, you know, would, <laughs> you know, it would take, I don't know, a three-hour interview to get to all of some of those factors, but, you know, maybe in the future that we're able to automate from the EHR um, to pull out that information? Well, I do think that was part of what we were trying to do. Um, this algorithm, and Heidi can speak more to it, has been validated. It's, it's used as a referral tool, so if in three minutes a patient can indicate whether they have any of the major risk factors present, um, that should quickly, that should shorten that three hour interview. But again, this tool is really to refer someone for genetic counseling. It's actually not saying go get a mammogram. Right, and what's, what's difficult, we've done years worth of systematic reviews for the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force and others about the value of risk factors uh, in predicting breast cancer and the value of different tools. And when you have a fairly common outcome and you have very common risk factors, they're not helpful. <laughs> more women get breast cancer who don't have any risk factors than those who do. Um, so it, it's not that helpful. Uh, so we need to be really strategic about what are the real flags for breast cancer. This may differ with other conditions, of course, but in this case it's not that helpful. So we shouldn't waste our time on that. No, but I think um, this tool moves us. Right? right, the tool moves us in the direction of taking the flags, the, the actionable items, and doing something with that. And as research moves along, there may be something else we add. You know, we need to be nimble enough to change as the science takes us there. And so prostate cancer may be different. I'm not as familiar, but again, I think they're stuck with a big problem. It's a fairly common um, outcome, and it has lots of common risk factors. So uh, finding the unique ones is difficult, and are they really predictive, or they just cause a lot of trouble with, again, we're screening, right, do no harm. So it, it's tricky. It's a little different than some other uh, shared decision-making tools that are, are done for other things. Good questions. I was really intrigued by your um, study of people's understanding of uncertainty, and I was wondering, how, like, what outcome do you use? How do you assess their ability using the graphic images to assess whether or not they understood their risk? I'm glad you asked that. Um, we did, a, we, of the um, 100 and, actually, an earlier study, 
75 women who participated with, in rural clinics. We brought in 21 of those women, and I think Lindsay was actually part of the interviewing process, and she may chime in. Um, we showed them various graphics, and we asked them, tell us in your own words what you see. The other thing is there was a little quiz, and what we did find is that um, sometimes they would, you know, with the pictographs, they might, if the denominators changed, which is, is actually a pretty current common finding, they might confuse the probabilities a little bit. So we had to be pretty careful with how we presented things, but we did, we tried to get, capture whether they understood what they were seeing through these interviews. And I don't know, Lindsay, if you want to add anything more from, because Lindsay actually got to do a lot of those interviews. <laughs> so, um, and, and, and so the other thing we've used is we've used Talk Aloud. You know, when they go through and they use the tool, we'll say, again, you clicked on that. Tell us, you know, what, why you're clicking on that. And so um, that also was, was revealing as well. Uh, people also perceive risk very differently. So you can show somebody, um, and I think that plays into what Heidi said about the scale model. You know, some, some people perceive that any time there's a number greater than zero, Oh, I'm at risk. Well, that actually isn't al that isn't always true. It often isn't true. So you know, if the risk is one out of a thousand, some people react. Oh, that's a very small risk. That I'm not going to worry about that. Someone else might say, Oh my gosh, it's one out of a thousand. I'm I'm a, I'm, I'm horribly at risk. Well, maybe no. If the average risk is 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 four out of a thousand, so we have to be very careful in how we word things, using plain language and asking a lot of questions about what they see. overuse our time. I think I think Joan is up. Thank you all. Thanks, Lynn. Can you hear me? So this is a really good follow-up to the prior presentation because we're thinking about a really nice new tool. And Ben's question was very appropriate. You have a great new innovation, a new idea. How do you get it used? How do you know if it's going to be used in the right way? So I decided Today, instead of just telling you about the present project uh, on medical scribes, I would give you some background about unintended consequences of health information technology and how we might analyze and think ahead about how to get these tools used. So about the unintended consequences of health information technology. And where's Keaton? <laughs> All right, so Keaton Whitaker is the intern working on the Scribe project, and I'll warn him, I'll give him a few minutes at the end to tell everyone what piece of this is yours for the summer. Because I'm going to be covering 20 years of research, and I'll get to the point where Keaton's project comes in, but I won't spend too much time on it. So this is diffusion of innovations theory. It goes back to marketing. I first heard about it when I was getting my MBA. Everett Rogers wrote this book way back in 1985 called Diffusion of Innovations. And since then, at least 6,000 studies have been done showing that this is a useful theory. So it's one of those very general, fabulous theories that you all need to know about, and I recommend the book. Basically, in a nutshell, Diffusion of innovations is a process by which an innovation or anything new, a new idea, an IT tool, is communicated through certain channels over time among members of a social system. And believe me, every single underlying thing here has been studied to death. But this is my little picture of it because I want to show you what leads up to unintended consequences. And so we have a you know, wonderful new informatics tool, which is the innovation. 
and we're hoping it gets adopted, maybe glacially, but adopted over time. And we can help things along with promotion, with communication, uh, with advertising. And there are consequences once it's adopted. And so you know, everyone thought that EHRs would do nothing but good in the world, right? And the consequences would be better health care for all. Nobody thought that there might be unintended consequences of EHRs, or health information technology. But when you look at it this way, what happens is there are unintended consequences, and we try to solve the problems caused by the original tool. So the original tool might have been EHRs. The unintended consequence is providers aren't necessarily happy with every part of the EHR. Uh, that's the unintended consequence. And so then we try to make things better. And communication was being decreased because of information technology in hospitals, right? And so nurses started using vocera, which is a communication tool you hang around your neck, just like this. And that, that was a new unintended consequence, brand new invention, to make up for the old invention of EHRs. EHRs decrease communication, Vocera comes in. It's, it's really good for sales of new innovations uh, when this happens. But it, it's almost a spiral. We get something happening, and then we try to solve the problem. So that's just what's happened with medical scribes. That's what, where I'm going from here. So unintended consequences are defined as Events or reactions arising from the introduction of a new innovation or technology or process not part of the intended purpose or goal. And the, the little uh, cartoon here shows this poor man trying to rest his elbow and all the dominoes are going to fall until one of them falls on top of him. Unintended consequences, if it's on purpose, then it's not unintended, right? So. The other word for an unintended consequence is a surprise. So in 2004, the notion of unintended consequences was novel. Maybe it wasn't novel, but it was not being discussed because it was creepy. It was not something we in informatics wanted to let anybody know because we wanted everyone to think health information technology was going to you know, be wonderful for healthcare. But I had been studying implementation of CPOE, and two of my colleagues around the world, one in the Netherlands, the other in Australia, were studying implementation of CPOE in their countries using, we were all using similar ethnographic techniques. And we happened to be at a conference together in Heidelberg, Germany, and we started talking about these creepy things that were happening, like mistakes being made because of health information technology that never would have been made in the paper world. And so we got together and we wrote this paper, and um, this was way back in 2004, and believe me, it was considered revolutionary. And it surprises me, two days ago, I looked at Jamia and saw that it's the most cited paper in the history of Jamia now, um, and it goes all the way back to 2004. So funny thing, we're still interested in unintended consequences of health information technology. So I'll go over the last 20 years of research, which we've, uh, my colleague Dean Sitting and I have published in this really pretty book. Uh, lemons, lemonade being made out of lemons, that's, that's our idea of unintended consequences. Um, we've done a whole bunch of site visits, this is a whole series of studies about provider order entry, unintended consequences, decision support, and the unintended consequences of that, health information technology, risks of HIT, and finally scribes as an unintended consequence of HIT. So we learned so much going into the field looking for unintended consequences. And it was interesting to me that people actually invited us to come and look. <laughs> um, but uh, they wanted to learn, too, the risk factors and, and what was going on within their own organizations. So we did find that there can be unexpected 
positive unintended consequences. And this is, this is a good one. He turns the patient instructions on the screen to the patient, and they go over it line by line, clarifying any questions, and the patient finds an error. And this happens. We've seen it happen everywhere. When patients are engaged, providers, if they know what they're doing, are often turning the screen to the patients and including them in the conversation, and the patient sometimes sees something. That's fabulous, and that was not expected. But there can be negative or adverse unintended consequences, which are the interesting ones. They're, they're the oopses, they're the mistakes. And this is an example of a wrong dose. Quote, you just have to du double check, you know, that's what you're supposed to do, but I know people get fast, and that's when errors are made. And so maybe someone really would prescribe these pills. Um, to an infant. Um, these are actually pills for horses, but um, we do know that medication errors can be made just because you clicked the wrong thing on a drop-down menu. This couldn't have happened in the paper world. There can also be two-sided consequences where they could be good or bad. They could be good for one person, they could be bad for someone else. or like this example, someone said, I'm glad the computer do goes down sometimes. Otherwise, I'd forget how to use paper. Now, this is a very you know, upbeat, optimistic, tolerant person. But sometimes there are two sides to an unintended consequence. So our team, going in and doing all these site visits, found 380 examples of unintended consequences. And we categorized them really, really carefully we came up, with, came up with these nine types. We've written papers about all of them, so you can go back and look at the publications if you're interested in any particular one. But I'm going to focus on the new kinds of errors because everyone else likes to focus on those too. These are insidious, silent errors very often. Juxtaposition errors, we use that term to just describe these errors that can be made when you use a drop-down menu and something is just really close to something else and you click on it. Quote, I ordered the test that was right next to the one I thought I ordered. You know, right below it. My little thingy, or the cursor, had come down and I clicked. And I'm looking at this one, but in fact I clicked on the thing before it. By that time I turn my head, I'm hitting return and typing my signature and not seeing it. And this was a quote when we go in and we observe, uh, this was a quote someone, a provider, gave us by turning around saying, see, I just made a mistake. You know, they always complain to us, but we actually saw this happening. How often do you think it happens without someone knowing about it? This person figured it out and told us about it, but very, very often it's very common that they enter the wrong order. Hopefully the pharmacist catches it or the nurse catches it. Here's an interesting unintended consequence. A colleague of mine in Great Britain sent it. It's from the Times. And it's another prescribing error, but it's not a dosage error like the, the one we were talking about before. Um, in this particular outpatient system, every time a provider ordered Viagra, I'm sorry, every, every time they ordered this Zyban drug, for smoking cessation, the system somehow translated that into Viagra. And so all these smoking people were getting Viagra <laughs> when they went to the pharmacy. And there's a cute little cartoon that says, I've given up smoking, but now I'm on a packet of condoms a day. And way down at the bottom, you can't see, it says no one was harmed by this. <laughs> so this happens. So. Now, how are scribes an unintended consequence of HIT? First, I need to tell you who scribes are. Now, this research is funded by ARC. Jeff Gold is the principal investigator. Vishnu is another principal investigator on this, as am I. So this is one of those two-sided unintended consequences because sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative. It became an industry because providers were forced to use the EHR. Remember my circular diagram? They had to use the EHR. They became overburdened. 
They're getting burned out from so many things. The EHR is enabling that burnout. And so they needed help. And they cried for help. And a new industry came forward to save the day. The upside being this new industry gives jobs to usually young people right out of college who want to be accepted into a professional school like nursing school, PA school, or a medical school. So they get a job. In the past, often they just volunteer to shadow, right, in a clinical setting to learn something about it and to put on their CV for medical school. Now they can actually get a paid job to do it. So they get something out of this very positive. Uh, the providers get something out of it help at the elbow by really bright people. Uh, however, and this is why ARC funded us, there was a suspicion that there might be some safety issues here because scribes have no licensure and no clinical training. And they're entering orders and they're doing things for providers that do carry some risk. So what is a scribe? Someone who uses the EHR to provide documentation assistance to providers there's no specific licensure for scribes. CMS, DNV, there are guidelines that they give. The Joint Commission offers some guidance. But they say they neither support nor pro prohibit the use of scribes. So it's, it's a new profession. MAs were in the same position a number of years ago. When I first started visiting hospitals, MAs had no particular licensure either. It was very variable how much training they had had. Now it's the same thing with scribes. They can be right out of college and not have, like, don't, don't even have to have graduated from colleges in some, in some places. So there's no licensure for them. So our study purpose was to make scribing safer, to describe the activities of scribes who use the EHR so that we could learn best practices, to turn those best practice ideas into competencies, which is where Keaton comes in. And those competencies will then be translated into training modules that ARC will make available freely uh, nationally and internationally. And that's the five-year plan for our project. So we used a, this model as a framework for studying scribes to make sure that we cover all of these things, the personal, environmental, technical, and organizational perspectives. And we used our rapid ethnography technique, where we go on site. Because so little had been known, well, first belt, CPOE, provider order entry, when nothing is known, it's really helpful for somebody to paint a picture of what's going on now. And that's what we do with our ethnography. So we're painting this broad picture of what scribing is like across the country right now. Um, we use a team to go in and do this, and we do it fairly um, expeditiously. We use a multidisciplinary team, several different techniques. For this study, it's primarily interviews and observations, and we empl employ what we call a grounded hermeneutic approach to analysis, meaning just that we take the words of those in the field and we analyze them to come up with conclusions. So you don't have to read this. I just want to give you the impression that we did collect a lot of data. Uh, we went to five different sites around the country, very carefully selected. We did over 80 interviews, many, many observations in the field. So just to summarize, from the patient perspective, so this is from the personal perspective that I told you about. Uh, the patient's perspective told us that they appreciate having the provider pay attention to them. We all have had the feeling when we are in the doctor's office, uh, the exam room, and the provider's just typing, and they're not looking at us, and they're paying more attention to the computer than they are to us. It's pretty irksome. This way, you can have scribe unobtrusively in the background and the provider can pay attention to you. They like that and they rarely object to having a scribe in the room. The challenges to this are providers very often don't tell the patient what that person is doing in the room, which is a little, you know, disconcerting for the patient. 
So proper introductions should always be made. These are, this is one of the best practices we found often is not being done um, because patients can be puzzled. Um, and some of them may feel uncomfortable and not say so. Uh, many of the um, people we interviewed who were not patients, by the way, we did not talk directly to patients. We talked to managers, uh, to scribes, and to providers, and we asked them how patients thought. So we didn't talk to the patients directly. But the others told us that um, some of the press gainy scores, which is, um, you've all been asked for these after you've seen the doctor or been in the hospital, um, you have to rate uh, your experience. And some people have written some comments saying they feel a little uncomfortable under some circumstances having the extra person in the room. This is not, not common, though. Mostly they like having the doctor pay attention to them. From the scribe personal perspective, it's great. It kickstarts your career. You can get a recommendation for medical school. You can actually get paid for something that's pretty fun to do. You're constantly learning, and you're making a contribution to health care. The challenge is they get minimum wage, usually, and they're worth way more, and they know it. <laughs> so that irks them in this pre-professional model uh, where they don't stay very long because very often they do get accepted to school and they're no longer scribes. There's a lot of turnover here. There is a more professional model of scribing where you have a medical assistant or a nurse um, do scribing, but primarily we're looking at this pre-professional model because it's more common. Uh, and the scribes told us the providers vary in style. This is a nice way of saying you get some cranky providers that you're working with once in a while, and they may do things that um, make you uncomfortable, or they may not introduce you and that kind of thing. Um, some scribes may have held back in what they told us because, after all, they're, they've been hired and they work for companies, and sometimes the companies have non-disclosure agreements and found all different reasons for scribes maybe not being as open as they could have been, but we still got an earful. So from the organizational perspective now, they feel documentation is better. So we went in thinking maybe documentation was worse, having untrained people doing it. These people do it all day long. They know the EHR. And you know I'd say 98% of the people we talk to feel that documentation is a lot better having a scribe do it. Standardization can be done this way because you have the scribe use templates. And most places keep on top of how well the scribe is doing the documentation, maybe even more so than they did for providers. And we saw so many times when scribes really, really help the provider and say, well, don't forget you told Mrs. So-and-so that you were going to order this. And the price says, oh, yeah. You know, having that third person in the room actually can be really helpful. The challenge is the scribe has to see or be told something that was done. Uh, so the provider has to talk during an exam, for example, to make sure that the scribe caught everything. Some providers, it's hard for them to do that. Um, the provider often does not review the work very carefully. Once they learn to trust a scribe, they let the scribe go with it, but it's their responsibility. It's so much their responsibility. They really should be looking at the documentation carefully. Workflow efficiency organizations felt really did improve. The only issues were a brand new scribe was uh, you know, obviously going to be a little slower than a scribe that has at least six months worth of experience mostly really helps the workflow. From an environmental perspective, the scribe industry has emerged. Uh, so this is, you know, this is good for the companies who hire out the scribes. This is good for the scribes. It's good for organizations that don't want to go through the hu huge human resources um, impacts of constant turnover with scribes. So the challenge is there's minimal regulation Big, big industry, hugely growing industry, little standardization. So we really do need to do something about this. We did not study this overseas model where this ad says, um, become a virtual doctor in six weeks.
by becoming a scribe, a remote scribe. Well, might be some safety issues there. Also, from the environmental perspective, compliance, safety, risks, there is some guidance available. The challenges are there needs to be a whole lot more guidance available. The EHR has issues. Everyone in this room knows that. Scribes are usually really good at it because they, they use the EHR all day long. They go through the training. And we found, I think this is so beautiful, very often they're super users. After all, they're right there in the middle of things. And other providers, other healthcare professionals can count on them for knowing the EHR. So sometimes they're official EPIC super users, for, for example. However, they need continuous training. And sometimes they work for a scribe company. They don't even work for the organization they're working in. They may not get the constant updates you may, might get on EPIC, for example. And ergonomics, there, there are always issues with er ergonomics because um, the rooms were not designed to have that extra third person in them. So to summarize what we found out in the field, there are upsides and there are downsides and risks. And we had not even thought to focus on the provider and training that might be needed for the provider. We thought all the risks were because we had untrained scribes out there. Um, but it turns out it's the provider's responsibility to make sure the scribe is doing what they're supposed to be doing. And the providers have usually um, no clue about the best practices for using a scribe. So we will be recommending that providers get training as well as scribes get further training. We are going to be developing the further training. We held, at the end of all of these site visits, a conference of 30 experts from around the country. We met for two days. We got so much good information from that group about the competencies we had found that are needed in all scribes and the competencies the experts from around the country feel all scribes need. And I'm going to let Keaton talk now about the next steps, because we have umpteen pages of transcripts from these two days worth of discussions. And let's see. Lynn, could you hand Keaton the microphone? Uh, yeah, as Joan mentioned, we're working to develop these competencies from the interview and um, record data that they collected from the conference. Um, so to create these competencies, uh, they've divided them into two lists. There's general scribe competencies that a scribe just needs to work in a doctor's office in an exam room. And then there's EHR-related competencies that directly relate to the work that they do with the EHR. So the study that um, I'm hoping to conduct is a modified Delphi study, which is kind of casting into the future and seeing what um, scribes will, be able to, will need to be able to do so that they can develop modules to help train scribes in the future. So this first round is developing lists of competencies that are definitely necessary for both general competencies and EHR competencies. And then eventually we'll move on to ranking these competencies so we can really um, hone in on what's going to be important uh, for scribes to know from the perspective of providers, um, scribe managers, hospitalists, hospital administration, um, and those kind of people. Great summary. Thank you so much. And yeah, so it's a partnership between the scribes and the providers. That's the bottom line. So. Maybe we'll get another grant after this one for competencies for providers using scribes. So we have maybe two minutes for questions. Sorry about that. Uh, Dr. Ash, how does that jive with Dr. Uh, Mohan Gold's uh, study in the simulation lab where the experienced scribes that were in one department for a long time, their accuracy and their intervariability was all over the map between 30 and 80 percent? That's proof that the scribes need more training. Uh, we need some really good data from actual documentation. We heard that everyone's happy with the scribes, but we don't have that really 
data-driven result to show that what people are feeling is actually happening in the field. So we need more of that kind of thing, and Dr. Gold definitely knows that. <laughs> On the, results you on the results you mentioned that administrators were more happy with the completeness of the documentation, um, was there any validation of that, that that was accurate, valid completeness as opposed to things in templates keeping their default that are checking off boxes for billing but may or may not be clinically accurate or appropriate? It's really interesting that these scribe companies, and I have to say I went into the study thinking the scribe companies may be a little on the sleazy side. Um, on the other hand, uh, we have learned that these scribe companies are really on top of things. And the three different ones we studied, every single month uh, they get a report from providers. So they have to make you happy, another reason for your going over the documentation, so that you can say, and that forces them to, so that you can say, yes, my scribe did a great job in documentation this month. Um, so you say that part of it. The health information management people and the billing people look usually, they do, I should have mentioned audits, I think I had them on one of my slides, that usually there's a monthly audit of what the scribe is doing. So um, they, there is oversight when these organizations are doing it the way they should be doing it. There are many small organizations that just hire scribes off the street, train them themselves. They don't like the EHR, so um, they decide to have a scribe come and use the EHR, and so they may not be the best people to do the training, um, but there are many places that do that. They don't have audits. They don't have, you know, the provider really doesn't. Uh, oversee very well. We'll have to include that in our provider training is uh, the importance of um, monitoring really, really carefully. So I, I have trust. So I know we have a model for simulations with gotchas in cases to, for instance, train residents or nurses about common EHR navigation errors that can be patient safety issues. Have they built scribe cases where they're specifically trying to have gotchas for providers in terms of 